name is Gary. I am a farm advisor, production horticulture advisor with the University of California Cooperative Extension, part of agriculture and natural resources. Uh, this was the most important thing to remember of the uh, whole talk. So now everything is downhill from here. And this is the last Wednesday organized by um, Dr. Middleton and myself and uh, hosted by the Farm Bureau uh, of San Diego and by the Irrigated Land Group. So thank you. Thank you for having us. And today, Today, you're going to get one hour of irrigated land group education that you need for your ag order. So congratulations, congratulations. But also, also we applied for certified crop advisor um, credits and you're going to get one of those CEUs also. And at the end of the talk, I'm going to show some, um, some code that you can scan. So enough with the introduction. What are we going to do today? We're going to talk about uh, substrate. Substrate is what some people call uh, media or potting media or, or, or potting mix or, or a horticultural mix. And most people call it just soil. And I'm not allowed to call it soil because I'm um, otherwise my academic friends will get mad at me. But that's what I, that's what I mean. And I put here on the first slide, <laughs> just to give you an idea of what we're talking about. That that stuff that we put inside the containers, inside the, the pots to grow plants. And we'll see that it's very difficult from, from soil, despite we sometimes calling it soil, is very difficult. It's very different from mineral soil, very um, from, from native soil. Namely, one of the most important differences is the density, is the density. Real soil is very heavy, it's very heavy. You wouldn't be able to pick up a 15 gallon uh, container full uh, filled, with, uh, filled with clay. You wouldn't be able to. And instead, if it's filled with the peat-based um, peat based substrate, uh, you can pick it up even if there's a tree in it. And so here I put a couple of examples, some, uh, um, some uh, um, substrate with frills, with nitrogen uh, fertilizer and other fertilizer frills in it. Uh, at the bottom left, you see uh, peat-based uh, peat substrate with um, perlite. Um, you can see some, are those bucarnias? I think they're bucarnias. And you can see that some at the bottom are very dry and some at the top, the substrate is very wet. So we're gonna talk about that uh, in a while. And then uh, you see one um, container with a geranium growing in it that is on a scale. And we're gonna talk about weighing, weighing container quite a bit. Sign up for my email updates. That's the best way to learn about uh, what I do. They don't let me put this in the main <laughs> website. So uh, please, please scan it. I get phone calls like, ah, Jerry, I'm trying to look for, for your website. I went to the UCC website and I can find you. So that's how you get to my website. And that's how you uh, sign up for my email updates. If you're here, you're probably getting those emails already. So what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about the materials that are used to, um, to make this uh, substrate. And typically it's organic materials like peat or, or coco coir and mixed in with uh, um, inorganic materials, sometimes like perlite or vermiculite. And then there is other materials like bark, et cetera, that are... Um, that <laughs> are yeah, it's just you and 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 people from Zoom. So welcome, and uh, and um, and and bark and and byproducts of other industry. For example, lumber. The lumber bark is a is a byproduct of the lumber industry. So we're gonna talk about the physical properties of this substrate because that's what determine how they interact with water and. Uh, 
uh, with the water and how they make it available to plants. We're going to talk about weighing containers that is called um, lysimetry. And here I got this super duper uh, scale that you can get wet. So we're going to, Mary here is going to play with all these things <laughs> since she's the only brave soul that came here. Um, how could I miss in, it? In person. <laughs> <laughs> And then I'm going to show you water retention curves that are a little bit of a nerdy thing, but uh, are important to make a point. And then we're going to switch gears a little bit. And from the physical properties, we're going to talk about chemical properties, uh, namely pH and electrical conductivity. And then we're going to talk about a little bit of nutrient retention management and some methods, some methods to test whether your uh, containers have uh, enough fertilizer or they have too much. So what are the materials that we use to make potting substrate, potting media, potting mix, container mix, container media, etc. Uh, this is the list, right? Peach is the peach is the king. It kind of has a little of a bad rap recently because uh, you know the 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 a lot of uh, newspapers say that it's not sustainable, and so there is a little bit of an opinion. I have no opinion whatsoever, but Pete has been um, Pete has been historically one of the most used um, substrates, and this is an example. You see, it's a super fluffy thing. It's a super fluffy thing. It's it's very it's very fluffy. You could make lower, lower. Is it good? <laughs> you could make you could make a mattress, right, with this thing. But it's very, it's very fluffy, and and I and 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 the but but the really real the, the property that it has it that is there's high porosity, right? It's a lot. It has a lot of empty space in it. You got sawdust. You got coconut core. You got perlite. Um, sand, wood fiber, a lot of stuff. This is an example of rock wool that is, there you are. So you're, so it's not only Mary. Um, you have company. So we have company. Um, this is, and we have a lot of friends on Zoom. Oh, hello, Zoom. <laughs> Sorry, the <Deanna. laughs> And uh, so this is rock wool. They put, they put some basalt rocks and some, 5000 degree oven and then they 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 spin it around and and it becomes this uh, spongy spongy thing and um and and the way this foam is a similar is a similar uh, material that is kind of a, a, a spongy is made of of a of a plastic uh, material that is that has a lot of that has a lot of holes that has a lot of pores so the functions of the substrate of the substrate is to provide some empty space, some empty space, some empty pores that can be uh, occupied either either by water or by air. And as 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 we will see, if you if you over irrigate and if you have those pores occupied by air, occupied by water, then there is no space for air, and roots cannot grow in uh, saturated um, in a saturated media. And I forgot to say that I stole these slides without permission from my friend, Dr. Bruno Pitten. So don't tell him, don't tell him, but I, at least I put his face here as an apology, I guess. Um, and often, often we pick these materials to have a really high pore space or porosity. And I'm going to, I'm going to define it. I'm going to define it in a minute. Um, so this is an example of, of substrate. You see some big pieces here that are bark. And then you see some smaller pieces that are um, koi or peach. And then you see some of these frills that is low release fertilizer. And then you see some of these white, white components that is sand. This is a big, this is a big pile of peat and bark substrate mixed. At the um, nursery, many of you do this, and then a machine or workers use it to fill the, the containers. This is fur bark. As I said, is a is a byproduct of the lumber industry. They 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 cut the bark off, they shave the, the bark off these trees to make uh, two by fours and stuff. 
and then and then we buy that stuff for 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 mixing it in um to make substrate coco coir is a, a byproduct of the uh, coconut industry believe it or not and it comes from india or 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 Ceylon or sri lanka and sometimes it has high um ec as high electrical conductivity so uh be careful depending on where it comes from and it's really easy to wet it's really easy to wet you can see that as soon as you put it close to water it sucks in the water really fast and it changes color uh this is redwood uh sawdust it's a soft wood so it doesn't have a lot of nitrogen draft uh, mostly hardwood has a lot of nitrogen draft but still um, it's something to be careful. Uh, nitrogen draft means that as you as you make your your mix, so microbial activity will fix uh, the nitrogen that is available, and so it will not be available for the plants. So it's common at the mixing at the time of mixing to add some uh, source of nitrogen in order to compensate for the draft. This pine bark. Uh, really big pieces, so typically it will not be used by itself, but it will be used by uh, mixing it with another material like peat or, or coco coir. So the, the, the peat provides the spongy, the spongy behavior, and the bark or the perlite provide the, the empty space, the, the airy, so to speak, behavior. This is peat moss. Um, one thing to say about peat moss is that it's hydrophobic when dry. So if you put this in water, you will see that it floats. It really does not want to get wet until until it sits there for a number of hours, and then and then it, when it gets wet, it really doesn't want to get dry. So it's kind of a weird. And this is very much in contrast to its coco coir. This is a picture, a close-up picture of uh, a, a a mixture of uh, mostly bark. And again, you can see these big pieces here that are that are bark, and then you can see the the the, the white grains that are sand, and then you can see these smaller these smaller fibers that come from uh, that come from from peat, and of course, peat is very expensive and bark is very cheap, right? So there is there is that too, and that's why this grower decides to put ten times ten times more more bark than peat, but this. This would be a very um, a very coarse material, very easy to drain. Uh, it wouldn't hold a lot of water. You would have to irrigate it very frequently to keep it to keep it wet. And then there is a word of different mixes. Originally in this slide, I had put only this upper left picture, but then somebody somebody told me, Ah, Jerry, if you're showing one brand then you cannot show only one brand and so i added a, bu a bunch of brands there and if you if you sell another brand that is not there i apologize and talk to me and uh, i'll make sure next time i talk about you too but there is a lot of brands that make mixes um so they 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 select the materials for you and they make mixes with certain characteristics and you can buy like ah i want their high porosity mix or i want their like propagation mix or i want their they will sell you a mix for um, various um, various needs that you have, and this one at the at the bottom left it said is a mix is a <laughs> homemade mix by somebody that bought some peat and they bought some uh, uh, what they call mulch like some some uh, yard waste uh, um, chippings and they bought some perlite and they mixed all together and that's a perfectly fine way to to do it. It's, it could be cheaper, obviously, than buying it already made. Um, but you've got to know, you need to know. Yes, question. Laura Murray would like to know, are any of these mixes for use in organic? Yes, yes. I think that, I think that one of these companies have an organic mix. Um, I know for sure that some of these companies make, maybe this one, L-M-O-R-G. I'm sure that some of these companies make um, mixes that are that are organic. I know for sure that you can use uh, peat in organic. You can buy it's Omri Omri listed, 
So you can you can use peat in organic, and and of course if they make um, if they make organic mixes, um, probably they have some source of nitrogen that comes from some organic material. Mary may know. Mary knows more than me about these things. No, I I know that there's some organic potting mixes that you can buy, and and you just have to kind of trust trust right. that that you know it really is. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, thank you. Good, good question. But, but in California, I think we have to remember too that it's not just Omri that you're looking for. It has to be licensed by the CDFA, That's and look for OIM on the label for organic input material. Yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Okay, so thank you for the questions. Keep them coming. And uh, okay, so now I wanna now that I now that you I mean we we looked at all those materials we had a lot of fun now I wanna bore you with some math, and I wanna define capillarity. When we were kids in high school, they showed us this picture, right? Everybody remember this picture at the bottom at the bottom right, where there are two where there are two little tubes, and one is skinnier, and the one is larger, and the and the skinnier one pull, pulls up more water. Or, or, or higher, I should say, pulls water higher. And then when we're in grad school, we studied this book and, and, and they gave us this formula. They gave us this monster formula and then it says, which reduces to, and you're like, well, well, if you say so. And then you get this formula that says P equals some constant divided R. So they're trying to tell us, look, that pressure, that pressure that develops in that pore that pressure that de that develops in that pores is inversely inversely proportional to the radius of the pore. The constant divided the radius. So the larger the radius of the pore is, the less the pressure that it develops. And this is illustrated in this picture again, right? Fat, big pore, small pressure. Skinny, skinny pore, lots of pressure. Now it turns out that it's not really a pressure because it's a negative pressure because it, it's sucking in instead of, of pushing out. So here in this table, I use that I use that formula to calculate how much tension. I call it tension there instead of pressure because it's a negative, it's a negative pressure, it's a negative pressure by the pore size. And then I was staring at all these numbers and I was like, how do I how do I explain? How do I make these people uh, a little relate to these numbers? How can you relate to these dry numbers? And so I said, well, okay, what is the size of about 50 to 100 micro micrometers? Turns out that your hair is more or less 50 to 100 micrometers. So imagine, imagine a little hole in your substrate. Imagine that there is a little hole in this substrate that is filled with water that is the size of 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 a hair, it will suck. It will develop a tension that is between three and fifteen centibars. That is more or less, more or less, the pressure, the, the tension that you develop with your mouth when you drink your coke. When you drink your coke, you know these really tall, big um, glasses made of plastic that you drink when you go to New Orleans and you get partying with all your friends and you have a little really tall straw. You know who has done that? Who, has the, who, who went to New Orleans and got drunk? How many? Only one in this room? Okay. <laughs> we just don't have to go so far. <laughs> so so with that taller, taller straw, you will develop a larger pressure, right? So probably we're here around around 15, right? And then instead, one micrometer, one micrometer is the size of a grain of flour or maybe a grain of, of, of clay. It's really hard for me to wrap, to imagine a thing that is so small. But imagine again, there is a hole in this thing that is that small, it will develop a tension that is comparable to the pressure that you have in your in your tires, in the tires of your of your car. This is the way this is the way I think about it. this is the way I try to relate these numbers because otherwise they're kind of abstract. But in 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 luckily, 
in horticulture, in a horticultural substrate, we stay at tensions that are relatively low. So compared to my friends at home uh, that grow in soil, we kind of grow in a weather, in a weather end of the spectrum and in the, in the end of the spectrum where the tensions are lower. So generally we are about uh, five to 10, maximum 20 centibars. Those are the tensions that we have generally in, in horticulture. And then I put there a, a sentence that says, as the, as the substrate dries out, small pores hold water tighter. And we get back to this, but the idea is that your, your body mix, your, your substrate is a collection of different sizes of pores. You have some big pores, you have some, some small pores. And the big ones are those that empty first. We'll see it in a minute. And so as the big one empty first, then the smaller hold water tighter. So the more this thing dries, the harder it holds on to water with a higher, with a higher tension. So now I want to define porosity, which is kind of obvious, but I want to define it. It's the percentage of empty space. And you can scan this video here where I'm out of the nursery and I, so I do all these things. But basically, basically you want to first figure out what's the what's the volume, what's the volume of your container. And sometimes you're lucky enough that they write it here. You see, 325 milliliters. Thank you, Ken, for writing on your pots your <laughs> your, your volume. Um, so sometimes you'll know because it's written there, but if you don't know, you can just line it. You can just line it with a with a bag, and this is a very common method. And you fill it with water, and you put it on a scale, and you figure out the weight of that water. And and we are using a trick. We are using a trick here that we know that one gram of water takes the space of one milliliter. So just by weighing water. Just by weighing water, you know how much space that that water that water occupies, and by doing that, you can measure the 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 volume of your uh, container. And so, once you know that, let's say that volume is two thousand milliliters, then you can say, well, okay, that that empty space, that empty space when it's occupied completely occupied by water. You can measure that again, and you will find out the porosity. Typically, in substrates, is I find that goes from sixty-five to ninety. So, when all the substrate, when all the space is occupied by water, we say it's a saturation. But the water doesn't stay there. The water gets pulled out by gravity forces. Those big pores that I defined earlier empty. Until, until all the big pores are emptied and only small pores remain filled with water. And so they develop some capillary forces that are the same as gravity forces. And now, um, and now the substrate doesn't, doesn't drain anymore. And we call that container capacity. So I want you to, I want you to focus on this, this state, when we don't get uh, any more drainage, we say that this container is at container capacity. And, and we call the water that came out gravitational water. And we call that space that that water used to, used to occupy, but now, now, now it's, it's emptied, we call it air-filled porosity or we call it airspace question. So I have a question about yeah, that. Yeah. And just what I've noticed in, in some in potted plants that yeah. I've seen. Do you have, um, when you say full drainage, sometimes sometimes after irrigating, we see like a difference, like a migration of some of the individual parts of the substrate that you're using. And, and you could have like more water at the bottom of the pot than at the top, yeah. even at what you call container capacity, kind yeah. of like we do in a field soil, a field capacity. So so what Mary says is that, and we'll, we'll, we'll get there in a minute, but when you are at container capacity, 
you still had you still had more water at the bottom than at the top, and you develop a, a, a gradient, a gradient of tensions, and therefore a gradient of uh, uh, volumetric water contents, where you have drier at the top and wetter at the bottom. And often, depending how fine your um, substrate substrate is, you will have what they call a, a perched water table. That means like a saturation zone that is higher or lower depending on how fine the 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 substrate is. And I'm gonna talk. I'm gonna address that in a minute. But ask me again if I didn't uh, if I don't answer your question. And so volumetric water content is the percentage of volume of water that is occupied by, uh, sorry, the percentage of volume of the part of the container that is occupied by water. So let's say at saturation, my volumetric water content is 80%. Let's say that it starts draining, then it becomes at 75%. And then when all that gravitational water drained out, let's say that my, my volumetric water content at container capacity is 65%. Now a question, now a question for everybody question for everybody. If at saturation the volumetric water content was 80 and that container capacity the volumetric water content was 65, how much gravitational water do I have? I got you. What's the percentage of gravitational water that we have? So we said, uh, sorry. So we said, where saturation, we get some gravitational water that comes out. It empties some airfield porosity, and then we're at container capacity. So if here I'm at 80 and I remove something, and here I'm at 65, how much was that something? Who wants to answer? 15. 15. 15. So 15% of my volume is the gravitational water, and 15% of my volume is now occupied by air, not water anymore. And 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 people people design people design purposely. Um, um, substrate in order to have at least 15%, 20%, 10% of gravitational water because we don't want it to be too wet. We don't want it to be too wet for a number of reasons, mostly because of diseases can develop if you're if you're keeping if you're keeping it too wet. So now just now I got everybody asleep with man. I want to get everybody wake up again with these sponges. So I got two volunteers here. <laughs> I made these sponges. I made these sponges. I cut them and glued them together to be 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. There's no trick. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. I promise there is no trick. It's 10 centimeters. You see, it says 10 here. So <laughs> 10 by 10 by 10. How much is that? 10 by 10 by 10? A liter. It's a liter. It's a liter. Exactly. It's 1,000 milliliters. So here I have a volume of a sponge that is 1,000 milliliters. And here I have a graduated cylinder that is also 1,000 milliliters. And here I have a beaker that is 500 milliliters. So now I want to place, I want you to place your bets. Write it down. Think about it. I want you to place your bets. What's the porosity of each of these sponges? What do you think the porosity is? You think the porosity is 80%? You think the porosity is 70%, 50%? Oh, I didn't want to say it up close first, Jerry. And <laughs> now, <laughs> here you're in the splash zone. You're in the splash zone. <laughs> Watch out, and Jeremy. Then, <laughs> and then we'll measure it. But I, you understand what we're doing? So we know that this thing, this thing, the volume of this thing is 1,000 milliliters, right? Now I'm gonna put it under water and then I'm gonna collect the water that comes out. 
naturally, which we call gravitational water. And then when it's at container capacity, I'm gonna squeeze the hell out of it until I, I, I squeeze out all the water and we measure how much was the container capacity. I want you to bet, I want you to bet what's the porosity and what's the container capacity of each of these sponges. Did you, did you place your bets? All right, you wanna do it? I oh, do you, it. Want, you want me to do sure. it? Sure. Okay, All here right. we go. All right. So, I what's, get, your, I so get, what's your guess? Careful with the, with the, let's not get the owl wet. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, of course. Okay, so you just want me to yeah. submerge? So submerge it until Oh, it's there it goes. Okay. And then you put it's it nothing, out. Nothing up my sleeve. <laughs> 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 a white rabbit. Exactly. Okay. Now you pull it out, you put like the water here. Oh. That would be the gravitational water, okay. right? Okay. So Do how am fast. I going to? Okay. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. So now this, that's the drainage, right? So now the water is coming out. How much is that? All right, it's almost not draining anymore. How many milliliters? It appears to be 300. 300. So 300 out of 1,000 would be 30%, right? Okay, now, why don't you squeeze it? Why don't you okay. get rid of the 300 and you squeeze it in the same beaker? Oh, uh, okay. Get. Okay, so we were at 300, now we're squeezing all the water out of it. Let's see how much we get. Not that much more. Not that much more. Would that would that be good for growing plants? Wait a minute. We were at 300. Oh, that was no, yeah. No, I know, sorry, we're at 200. Oh, 200 to... went to 300. It see, was... I should have worn my glasses. So, so it was 200, so the gravitational water was 20%. Remember we said 15, 15 to 20%. So it's it, it behaves similarly. Mm -hmm. But then but then the rest was very little. It means that that thing has a lot of solids, right? We got out of it only 300 milliliters of water. It means that the solids are 700. Does it make sense? So it doesn't have it doesn't have a lot of porosity compared to this that maybe has eighty percent of porosity. Did I convince you? More or less. I was gonna say this has more porosity right? than this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, me too. Yeah. You wanna try the other one? Okay. Are we satisfied? Do people at home understand what we're doing, or they're just bored to death? Tell us, people from home, tell us. We're dying to know. We care about you deeply. <laughs> <laughs> We're here hanging out, playing playing with fun. I can't and... tell if it's absorbing off. When do I know? When it's all absorbed? Yeah, when it doesn't bubble anymore. Okay. Yeah, you can, you can squeeze it just to... Yeah, uh... What is your second sample again? Your second, the sponge, and then what is this one made out of? Some foam, some foamy stuff. Just some foamy oh, stuff. Okay. Some, some um, um, insulation material that is just a foam, but it's. Oh. If, if my if my measurements are right. Oh wait, I better pour this back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, it just can't be a significant. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, what do we get? We have a question of, is this what PCA training is for? Kids, don't try this at home. <laughs> okay. This is almost 300 All right. without squeezing. Without squeezing, so this one was that holds that gravitation less gravitational water. This is thirty percent gravitational water, and then let's see how much is the container capacity. 
Yeah, it's just about 300. Okay. So this is this is just an analogy. I just want people to to understand that this is just an analogy. Oh, look at all that oh. water. <laughs> all right. How much did you get? Considerably more, over four hundred. Okay, over four hundred. So over, and there's a little bit more left. So it was two hundred, and it went to four hundred. Right. So the gravitational mm -hmm. order was twenty percent, and then we get another twenty percent. Oh, is that all? Um, that's all. More? That's all. No, no, oh, thank okay. you. I would really appreciate your oh, help. Of course, it's my pleasure. But again, these had 40% of porosity. These had 40% of porosity that, again, is a lot lower than this. That's why we use these to grow our plants and not sponges because it has a lot of more uh, container capacity. So now let's keep going. I hope that people got their bets right. And this is an illustration of again this gravitational water. This is a this is a scale. This thing is a scale that measures the weight of this container every 10 seconds. And then and then this cable measures it. And here I'm plotting it. And so I'm doing this experiment with a friend of mine whose name shall remain untold. And he is very adamant about irrigating a lot. And I'm like, well, maybe we could cut a little bit on the irrigation and never want to. And this, and this is the weight, this is the weight of the container. So who wants me to tell, who wants to tell me what is this big jump here? What happened, what happened here that the, the weight of the container increased a lot? We irrigated. We irrigated. Thank you, Mary. We irrigated. So we're irrigating at seven in the morning and we're irrigating at seven in the evening. And so look at this one, at seven in the evening we irrigate and what happens here that all this weight went back down within hours. What happened? That was the gravitational water leaving the pot. That was the gravitational water leaving the pot. So never to be used again. Did we need to irrigate until up here? Did we did we did we need to irrigate all that much? Maybe no, right? We could have we could have irrigated until here because this all this water drains anyway, right? And then, as you can see, the the container capacity is not an exact number because during the night the plant is not using any water, and this line keeps going down, but slower and slower. So typically. Typically, we say, well, within two hours, you approached container capacity. But here, within two hours, yes, we were here, but it still keeps raining. Still keeps raining. So here now, we are at container capacity. We irrigate again. That pot is trying to drain the water. But now the plant starts using it. You see the day compared to the night. The night plant is not using any water. During the day, it is. Did I convince you? Yes, question. Okay, so if the container capacity is that that um, forty two eight hundred, where would like the the need to irrigate come in? Because you don't have to you don't have to irrigate at container capacity. It's something less than that, right? Yeah. So where would you have to irrigate? It depends. Here we're irrigating every day. No, no, right? no. But I mean, like based on based on the um, based on the on on the water usage i mean is there is there some point that you say now i have to put water on and i only have to put it on you know just slightly over container capacity so i'm not wasting all of my water yes that that question depends on a lot of things and particularly on the plants right you want to irrigate before that plant gets the water stress right in theory in practice we irrigate way earlier than that. And we irrigate every day or twice a week anyway. So the question is, could you wait more? Maybe, but but in practice you don't, right? And there is and there is methods like, okay, let's plant, let's leave the plant there until it starts wilting, and then I, I use half of the volume that that gets me to wilting point. There is some there is some rules of thumb there, but in but in practice, what we could have done here is just irrigated 
until we get it to container capacity again, or a little bit more. Or we could have waited two days, and presumably this weight would have gone down here, and then we would have had applied the water to get it to container capacity again. Right? Did I convince you? More or less. Well, yeah, but it just looks like how, however this is going, that there's, that there is, just visually looking at it, that about a third of two thirds of the water being put on is not being used by the plant. It's exactly. just leaching. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So this is this is an example of not a very good management. Oh, okay. Okay. This is an example of not a very good management, and you you can also hear mm -hmm. the mud coming out of the of the of the substrate that because the substrate with a lot of water also typically kind of degrades. I put this other picture here. At the very beginning of an upside down part with a um, with the um, here you okay. see this it starts degrading at the at the bottom it kind of gets mushy because of, mm -hmm. of all that water turns it into into mud and the other thing that you can see here in that not very good management is that you see algae on the gravel here. Mm -hmm. You see, because it's it's it, it drains too much, it's very wet. All that nitrate, all the all those nutrients get leached out, and so here algae start growing. So this is not a very good management. We probably we probably could have saved one irrigation per day and made the other one half. But this is not uncommon. This is not uncommon. And and again, unless you put one of these super super machine and you measure it and you plot it, sometimes you will not know. So the way the way I think about it is a, a bucket with a hole on its side, and so there is some there is some airspace that you cannot use. There is some airspace that you cannot use. There is some gravitational water that comes out, and there's some, some container capacity that, for all intents and purposes, is the only one that you can use. And again, we said that that gravitational water is about 10 to 15, sometimes 20 percent in very coarse material, and your container capacity is about 50 to 70 percent. Uh, so now you learned. Now you learned that if you know the volume of your pot. You don't need, even if it was completely dry, you don't need to apply more than 50% of the water of the volume of that pot. So that's that's one piece of information that you learned today. And then you can you can ask yourself or you can measure it or can, you can look it up. There's a lot of there's a lot of values available in the literature for container capacity, or you can ask me. But again. You go from 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 low sixties to 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 seventy. Here's another example of container capacity fifty to eighty. Um, another phenomenon that we talked about with 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 Mary earlier is that the finer the finer your material is, the higher that wet that saturated zone will be. And this is a really cool picture that I stole from Dr. Paul Fisher. Thank you, Paul. Please don't tell him. Um, and and he did it with he did it with the, with the, with this guy. And you can see you can see the, the saturated uh, zone here is higher, which is the same way of illustrating this, but it looks a lot cooler. And so the the result of this is that you have a very if you have a very fine material, your pot should be taller because otherwise. You're basically not using. There is no room for your for your um, for your roots to grow. Like in this example, it should be taller. In this case, you almost you almost give up half of your um, pot. Now, this may look uh -huh. yes. Question, question, question. No, no question. Somebody was just sneezing. Um, sometimes had that effect on people. Some mostly yawning, mostly yawning, but sometimes also. Um, okay. So.
So this is a master release curve. It puts its a relationship. It's a relationship for substrate. It's kind of the signature. It's kind of the signature of your substrate. It tells you how much is the volumetric water content of it. What's the percentage of water that it has on the y axis? And on the x axis, we have tension. Remember, I told you when all the pores are filled, there is no tension, and then the bigger the bigger pores start draining, and as they drain, there is less water content in the substrate, and more and more tension start developing in the in the substrate. Hey, Kevin. Hi, Jared. How are you? Oh, yeah. I just got a good. gift for you. Have some cookies. Have some more. God cookies. bless you. Thank yeah, you. yeah. No, God bless you. I had a I had a sample, so I was going to ask, gonna ask about these things. All right. Oh, oh, wow, you oh the names. Names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have some wow. cookies with your oh, coffee too. Oh gosh, you got um, it. you're lucky we didn't have you to do Thank the demonstration. Thank you. Right? Right. Good, good to see you. Thank, Thank you for being with us, Steve. Yeah, yeah. In that truck. Look, this is what the this is what this curve said. This is what the curve said from the folks at home that are still awake and or alive. This is what it tells you, right? And so, here's my question. Here's my question. Do I want to grow my plants? Do I want to grow my plants in this area of the curve where it's very steep? Meaning that there is a little change in tension. There is a little water stress. Or do I want to grow my plants in this area where there is a lot of tension develops or a very little change in, in moisture? Where do I want to be? Where do I want to be? Do I want to be stressed? Do you want to be stressed or don't you want to be stressed? Who likes to be stressed? Who, Who likes those plants to be stressed? So we, we try, we use this area of the curve. We use to answer right. to answer Mary's question that asks, where, where do I want to apply my water? And I said, well, it depends on a number of things and mostly on the plants, but probably for example, from the people at home that don't see me in the central, in the in the graph that is in the middle, you probably don't want to go lower than 40% volumetric water contents that corresponds to a tension of about three centibars. Right? You may want to get to four, you may want to go to eight centibars that would correspond to 30% of volumetric water content, but not probably not more than that. Because a little, if you let it dry a little bit more. Now it will develop a lot of tension, right? And notice, notice that at the highest tension at the end of the graph, still I have more than 25% of water. But that water is held in these super tiny little pores and that develops such a little big tension that my plants cannot use it. And this is on the left, I this is the curve that I made and I get it. I get it very close to what people have published. So that's my uh, academic accomplishment right there. Uh, but but we can do this together. We can do this together. If you have if you have a tent, if you have a substrate, we can measure it together and we can come up with your own with your own curve. Now that other thing that Mary asked, which next time you give this talk, Mary, is the um, is the thing that I'm 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 discussing in this in this slide. So you know the swimmer, you know the swimmer that goes under water and swims in a in a pool and it's exposed to a to a high uh, or she is exposed to a high pressure, right? When you swim down down in the water you got your 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 ear hurt. And so the believe it or not, believe it or not, the same thing is true in substrate, but upside down. Instead of being a pool, is a is an upside down pool where you get, instead of getting pressure, you get tension. And the more you go up, the more tension there is. And this may sound a little nerdy. This may sound a little nerdy, but the, the result of this is this gradient, is this gradient of moisture. So if you look at this spot at six inch, it has a tension of 1.5 centibars. And so it has 30, 
30% of water content, while at the bottom, it has 70% of water content. So it's a lot wetter here, it's a lot wetter here than it is at the top. And so that's why if you stick a finger at the top or you look at the surface of the pot, sometimes you say, oh, whoa, I got irrigated, it needs water. And instead at the bottom, there's a ton of water because naturally, just because of gravity and just because of how the world works, um, there is a gradient of, of different humidities that develop within the pots. Now that I've bored you with all these graphs and with all this math, again, Paul Fisher has a video online where he doesn't bore you with numbers. And instead he has developed a um, color, color code and, 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 and a set of rules to determine the wetness of substrate of a peat of the of a peat based substrate and he has five different levels and so it says well does it glisten if you touch it does does it wet your your fingers it, does it is the color is the color dark is the color clear and he uses these five five different uh, categories to train uh, to train people so if you have your irrigators and, and, and they don't like numbers particularly and math particularly, you can watch this video and you know I'm also available to train them on this different approach. Now I only have five minutes left. I want to talk about chemical properties real quick. Peat and bark, lower pH, just by their nature, they're acidic. And so it's common to apply limestone or better dolomitic limestone that also has mag uh, a magnesium to, um, to increase the pH, to, to compensate for this acidity. You need to keep in mind that also if you apply nitrogen in the form of nitrates, that will increase the pH. And if it's that ammonium lowers, lowers it, and also, since now we are 100% on Colorado River water, we have high alkalinity. And alkalinity is the concentration of carbonates and bicarbonates. And the way I think about it is that our water comes in with some lime already mixed in. So our water has some liming effects. So keep in mind all these uh, different effects on your pH. And so you may not have to apply a lot of limestone when you mix your uh, peat and bark to make your substrate because some of these other effects may raise the pH by themselves. Um, nutrient retention is low. And so we generally think about the piston flow. So I have my I have my pot with my substrate in it. There is a solution that has some nutrients in it. When I apply more because I irrigate, it, it displaces it displaces the previous solution that was there and the new solution takes its place. And the, and the capacity of the, of the substrate to hold nutrients is quite limited. So people use it continuous liquid feed and we have a lot of numbers in the red book and, and, and in other books that tell you how much nitrogen your plants need. Feed with 100, 150 ppm, they mean ppm of nitrogen, from 14 blah, blah, blah weekly, right? Fertilize two times a week with 200 ppm of nitrogen, blah, 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 alternating, alternating right? So this is, this is some, this is some, insight on how much uh, nitrogen your plant needs. And of course, the solution, electrical conductivity can be tested with a cheap with a cheap instrument like this. I'm showing for two different brands so I don't get in trouble. And also the pH can be tested with similar um, handheld meters. And that determines a lot of availability or deficiency or toxicity of micronutrients. And I don't want to talk about it now, but talk to me if you're interested. So now we are three minutes left. 
And I want to tell you about these methods. These are methods. These are methods for you to sample in your plants the solution that is in the substrate to ask yourself the question, am I over fertilizing? Am I under fertilizing? And, and one of the methods is called the poor true. It's the simplest. You just look up in a table how much water, depending on the container size, how much uh, deionized or, 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 or reverse osmosis water you have to add. And it tells, they also tell you how much it will come out at the bottom of the, of the container. You collect it with the pan and you can test it with one of these instruments. The other method is collecting substrate from the bottom half or the bottom two thirds of the containers. Don't take it from the top because evaporation brings a lot of salts up there. So there's a ton of salts up here that you don't want to sample, otherwise they will mess up your read. And you can you can scan this code. This is a professor from the University of Massachusetts, and you take the sample, you let it dry. And then you apply twice the water, twice the volume of water of the substrate that you have. So it's kind of a quick and dirty method. And then you filter it with a with a coffee filter, and you get out this solution. And again, you measure the AC. And there is a lot of guy, a lot of people, a lot of academics. And I had the I had the honor of meeting Dr. Garrett Owen, that spent their life, their career, coming up with um, values for you and check this out for poinsettia they tell you one to two extraction they mean this method poor true they mean this method and SME saturated media extract they mean the method that you get if you send the sample to the lab so that for a ton of for a ton of different plants they tell you what's the concentration of of uh, electrical conductivity that you should have. Of course, they give you a range to, to, to grow them well. So if you're, if you're low, you know you need to add fertilizer. If you're high, you, need, you know you need to leach with, with, with fresh water. And you can go on this website, it's called Fert, Dirt, and Squirt. Don't Google it, don't Google it. You'll find some weird stuff. I put, I think that linked over to Grand Geno's website. I'm not sure what's going on. Don't try to Google it. I tried it. I put the code for you here so you don't have to Google it. And uh, uh, yeah, I don't know who came up with that. I don't either. Um, finally, the leaching fraction is how much water comes out at the bottom when you irrigate compared to how much water you apply. It's easy to measure how much you apply. You put five pans and you measure, you pull out the dripper from, from one of the plants, you take the average, and from five others, instead you put the pan at the bottom of the container, you measure how much it is. In this example, we got 42%. That means 42% of the water on average that we applied came out at the bottom. That's a really big number. If you look up in the book, they tell you, 21% for this condition, or if you ask a guy like me. So in this case, we were, again, we're leaching a lot of water. And again, we're wasting water, we're wasting fertilizer. This is a very quick and dirty method and call me, we can do it. I'm kind of a nerd about these things. We can do it together. Um, and it's a very quick and dirty method to learn whether you are using too much water or too little. With this, if you made it to this point awake, you can scan this and you will get CCA credits. Um, and uh, you also got irrigated land group credits. And so I'm gonna leave this slide up for those of you that needs to scan it. I'm, it's 2 p.m., I'm one minute late. If people have questions, I'm here. Otherwise, we're going to eat all the cookies that we have yeah. there. Question from home. There's also one outside. Oh, thank you. It's kind of like an IQ test. It doesn't work. 
it does. It, it does. There's also right website, to the, yeah, right yeah. to the CCA website. If I do, you have to you go, go to the, the website. App. Yeah, yeah go, go to the app. Just go to the app. Yeah, go to Very the app. Very good, Jerry. And finally, right. there's another code. My oh. bosses want to know everything oh. about your gender and uh, and uh, stuff and your demographics. Of course. So, but it's optional. You don't have to. You don't have to do. It. I have to tell you to do it, but you don't have to do it. That's yeah, but. Point. Yeah. This is important for your job. Yeah, you, yeah, you got to justify it. But also, he needs the you know, thing. But exactly. But I'm interested. You can also say, like, if you like the topics, if you like my style, if you like the cookies. I love the cookies. Okay. <laughs> okay well, we didn't like the cherry, but the cookies. The cannelloni, yeah, what is, when is the cannelloni coming? <laughs> so here it is. You can, you can I take this. Actually. Okay. I can take, I can take it from yeah. Oh, bless your heart. Thank you. Um, so thank you for from the folks from home. If you don't have any questions, we'll see you next time. I'm typically I'm typically very very uh, successful, very popular in December when people need all the credits for the year. <laughs> DCA, and you're coming next week to the Farm and Nursery Expo because you're going to do something at your yeah, booth. Yeah, you're yeah. sampling. Ah, uh, yeah. And we'll see you. And yeah. we'll see you That's right. at the Farm and Nursery yeah. Expo on the second of November. Right. Yeah, on November second. It's really good. And um, yeah, and we'll give another of these talks. I'd be I'd be uh, dressed like Santa Claus. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, I had uh, a question for you though. Yeah. So I got this sample in the mail, and I don't know. It was on a it was on an email, and it Lika, was called yeah, Lika. Lika, yeah. But I don't know much about them. So this is some uh, uh, 